All right, so this is a lecture on program design. And normally in this lecture, I would have a couple of examples that we would do as a class. And then I would walk around and look at your designs and comment on them to make sure you're using the semantics of the diagrams that we're introducing today correctly. Um, I'm not going to be able to do that, obviously, because an online lecture, a video lecture, is a little bit different. Uh, so if you have questions, as you go through and create example structure charts and control flow graphs, uh, please contact me on Google Meet, on email, on Blackboard, in the discussion forums, and we will uh, try to get answers to you as quickly as possible about what works and what doesn't. Uh, there are some things that we can't answer. Those are generally questions about design. Is this a good design or a bad design? Uh, because the answer to those questions usually is, it depends. In some contexts, uh, one design can work, and in other contexts, the exact same design could fail. So it's hard to say that the design itself is bad. Mostly what I'm looking for, especially on a, an exam format, is are you using the semantics of the tools correctly? We want to make sure that you have something that is at least interpretable um, when, you, when you create a structure chart or a control flow graph. All right, so what is program design? Well, the first key piece to, to know about it is that design, the design piece of it, is essential, meaning it can't be skipped. Um, it's inherent, intrinsic, fundamental. You're not going to have the opportunity to just not have a design. If you try to skip the design process, the program design phase, what actually has happened is that you've created something with a really, really bad design. It, the, the software, if it's functional at all, it's going to have an architecture um, if, you, if you're able to compile it and get it running. And that architecture would be really, really terrible if you haven't focused on the design aspects of building the software system. So uh, program design is really focusing on the parts that are actually implemented in source code. Uh, and that, that's true whether you're starting with a framework or not. So if you're building something like a, a Ruby on Rails or Django application or any, any framework-based application, um, you still have a design component to it. The framework is obviously biasing you in a particular direction for a particular architecture, but there's still design that goes into the, the building out of the rest of the architecture. Uh, it's, so don't read this uh, implemented from scratch to me. Oh, well, if you have a framework, you don't have to worry about design. You still have to worry about design, even in those cases. Uh, there's two approaches that we've talked about most of the semester, the traditional approach and the agile approach. In the traditional approach, you normally would have a fully developed design before you begin implementation, and often this would be an entirely different team. You would hand the design over to the implementation team, and they would begin doing implementation. Uh, most of the time, the design would be documented in advance uh, before the implementation even begins. Uh, yes, this still happens. This is still... Uh, a way software is, is developed, and it actually can be a rational approach to doing software design, especially in cases where the, uh, the, the problem you're addressing has severe consequences for failure, right? So if you're trying to land a uh, rover on Mars, or if you're developing software for uh, providing radiation treatments to uh, chemotherapy patients or something like that, uh, then you would want to make sure that the design is very well understood before you really begin the final implementation and, and separating the processes is, is a good way of doing that. In an agile approach, however, design and implementation are very difficult to separate. And so much of what I'm saying in this lecture would be uh, a little bit difficult to do uh, from the standpoint of an agile software project. Uh, normally, you're not going to have documentation for design. You may have design documentation for complicated parts. In fact, that is actually kind of the goal of Agile. Remember, when we introduce Agile, uh, they're not essentially saying everything about the traditional approach is terrible. They're sort of saying that it's just emphasizing the wrong parts of software development and that in a complicated system, you are going to want design documents, right? You are still going to need that for some parts of the system. Okay, so let's talk about design specifications. This is actually a big part of the project, which we'll be introducing very soon. Uh, the second deliverable in the, the project that, that we'll be introducing very soon. Uh, essentially, a specification is just identifying the parts of the system that are going to be implemented as software and giving guidance on how they should be implemented, how they need to be architected, that sort of thing. High-level guidance on how they need to be implemented. Uh, so the software developer could then take this and turn it into an actual implementation. Uh, design specifications consist of both diagrams and text, and you need both of those. Uh, if you only have one, then the interpretation is going to be a little bit more ambiguous. Everything is going to be interpreted. interpreted. Um, and so if you have both, 
then if there's an ambiguous statement in the text, you can look at the diagram to potentially figure out uh, how to resolve that ambiguity, and vice versa. If there's an ambiguous uh, part of the diagram that isn't immediately clear, you may be able to refer to the text to disambiguate that. Uh, this relationship between the diagram and the text is actually one of the key things that makes software development precise, that makes it possible for us to develop working functional software systems uh, that, that comply with both. Right? So we want to make sure that we're explaining why every single part of the design exists, uh, and that why piece is actually a critical, critical element for design specifications, even though the design is really about how we should architect and build the software system. Right? And we never want to lose sight of the why, because if we do lose sight of the why, then when questions arise about the how, we can't easily answer them. Okay, design artifacts. So we've previously talked about the bold-faced artifacts in some detail. Uh, for example, we covered interface structure diagrams in the previous lecture. Uh, and this is not even a, com a complete list of design artifacts. I'm just sort of listing the ones that are mentioned in the textbook. Uh, but this is one of the main reasons why understanding the kind of reasoning needed by a tool um, is so critical. We talked about it, that in a previous lecture as well. Like the, the Understanding what your problem is, what sort of reasoning would solve your problem, and then identifying a tool that helps you do that sort of reasoning is, is a really critical element in software design. Uh, it's easy to just pick what you're familiar with and, and try and use that to solve the problem, but if you're just grabbing a tool you're familiar with, uh, even if it's you know so, sort of close to appropriate, as long as it is not 100% the tool you should be using, you're going to make the problem harder to solve by, by using that familiar tool. It will lead you down blind alleys without you being able to recognize you're being led down a blind alley. Uh, so all of the bold-faced ones are ones that we've talked about in some detail, and in the, today's lecture we will be talking about structure charts, which are right here, and also uh, control flow graphs, which I don't think I've even listed on this diagram, uh, but we will talk about those as well. All right, so next section will be on structure charts.